This is an interview with Tim Scarp. Tim is the host of Machine Learning Street Talk, one of the most popular machine learning podcasts. ML Street Talk sometimes discusses concepts like artificial general intelligence and AI alignment, though most of the time they approach it from a different angle than his podcasts, with much more skepticism. This interview was recorded at NeurIPS, the biggest AI conference, next to a sign that said, alignment is what you need, change my mind. And the goal of this conversation was to have our mind changed by learning about Tim's sources of skepticism regarding AI alignment. Tim is being interviewed by Alan Chan, a friend of the podcast doing a PhD in email at Miller, with a strong interest in AI alignment. You'll probably see Alan again in the coming videos, but for now, here's our conversation with Tim Scarp. Yeah, yeah. So just to, I guess, um, calibrate myself, what, what are your, uh, you know, skepticisms? Okay, so um, I mean, I'm, I'm a fan of Francois Chollet, and Francois Chollet is well known. Uh, do you remember he wrote a, an article called something like the implausibility of the intelligence explosion? So most of my skepticism is along the lines of, I think that there are all sorts of bottlenecks in large systems. I mean, if you look at Google, he cites as an example of a super intelligence, and it's, it's hit a scaling factor. And the reason for that is because it's externalized and distributed. It takes a long time to get a pull request done. It takes a long time to get code checked into the river. There are bottlenecks everywhere, even with, um, you know, the kind of hardware that we use for computing, there are bottlenecks in creating the silicon and, and distribution and, and so on. So my intuition is, is that there's a, there's a scaling bottleneck there. Yeah, I think this seems kind of reasonable. I guess, um, my take is that, um, certainly there do seem to be bottlenecks with systems that were building right now or have built like Google, for instance, but it seems a bit more plausible to me that AIs might be able to escape these bottlenecks. So issues with communication, for instance, at Google, right? Um, it seems like an AI would have a much easier time at communicating with different copies of itself around the world, let's say, um, and achieving a certain goal. Um, I guess we can get into like more nitty gritty, like bottlenecks, but um, yeah, did you have like sort of more core, uh, like sources of skepticism? Um, well, another thing is, so again, reading that, that, um, that book, and again, I'm sure it's an, an extremely low resolution view in, into what you folks think, but um, a lot of it comes back to the definition of intelligence that some of you folks choose to use. And it's, um, it's based on a single principle, it's a unifying principle, which is this idea of a, a rationalist agent making a trajectory of, of, you know, kind of Bayesian optimal decisions. And I think it's got, it's very elegant. I think it's beautiful. I mean, you know, like AIXI as a mathematical theory is wonderful, but I think it's intractable. And I subscribe to different views of intelligence. So, you know, you, using this AIXI conception, you could argue that something like alpha zero is super intelligent because it performs so well at a particular thing. And I think task specific skill is not the same thing as intelligence. I think intelligence is the information conversion ratio, the ability to um, be flexible and to very quickly, given a small amount of information, experience and priors, do something completely different to what I was trained on. So, and there are other views of intelligence as well, like based on behavior and function and capability and so on. But um, I think most of it traces back to, I mean, certainly instrumental convergence traces it back to this idea of, you know, having this absolute will to do one thing at, you know, potentially let's kill all the humans on the planet in pursuit of doing this one particular thing. Yeah. So I guess there, there are two things here. The first thing you mentioned was this idea that, you know, um, when we think about um, the classical super intelligence argument, it sort of considers agents to be consequentialists um, pursuing some act. Uh, the second sort of thing you mentioned, um, it was about um, like intelligence being more than just like narrow task performance. Um, yeah. So I guess on the first thing, um, I think I'm pretty sympathetic to what you said. Um, so I guess like I do agree that the story for machine learning systems that we're building nowadays, it's a little bit more complicated. We're not building like pure utility maximizers. Um, but I guess I have a lot of uncertainty about like to what extent, like how far do we need to go to building pure utility maximizers to get to some level of danger? Um, we are building some time. So I guess with supervised learning systems, um, like, you know, GPT-3, right? It's not totally clear that this is a, you know, agent that is pursuing some reward. When you train it with reinforcement learning with human feedback, though, you know, it seems a little bit closer to this because you're literally training it to maximize some reward in some unspecified way. Um, with reinforcement learning systems, like full-on reinforcement learning systems, I think you get much closer to, to the classical threat model in Bostrom. I think that's sort of, um, you know, the, the type of worry coming from people who worry about uh, you know, out of control artificial intelligence. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think it is an open question, you know, to what extent do we get the types of misgeneralization 
um, like failures that actually occur. Like, you know, I think the ML community has done a lot of work in the past few years in trying to formalize power seeking and trying to find examples in which, you know, the goals we specify at training time don't generalize, um, you know, to, to test time. And like, I think, you know, this work uh, has been pretty good um, at like showing that this thing can actually occur in like simple environments. Uh, and like, there might be more theoretical reason for us to believe that things would occur in more complex environments. But of course, we need evaluation to figure out, you know, exa how exactly is this going to occur? And like, you know, um, is this going to be as easy to fix when we scale models up as, you know, with models right now? Yeah, well, you said some really interesting things there. I mean, um, I'll, I'll touch first on the reinforcement learning for human feedback. Um, and I, I worry that something like that is going to make us fooled by randomness because we anthropomorphize models like GPT-3. And I noticed when I use GPT-3 that I am fooled by randomness. It, it's absolutely incredible, right? It's really, really incredible. And I only notice failures when I'm using it non-interactively as part of a software stack or in a workflow engine or something like that. And it's because we, we cherry pick quite a lot. But I, I agree that it has meaningfully, uh, you know, it, it, it's made it almost deterministic when you greedily sample from GPT-3 that, it, that it's doing something that I want it to do, which is very interesting. But I could cynically go back to Searle's argument, you know, which is that basically in, in lieu of biology, computers don't have any um, intentionality right? Um, and it's impossible to replicate an intelligence in silico. That's an extreme argument, but you could make that argument um, as well. I also wanted to touch on your, um, there's a certain language that I, that I hear from, from um, your, your part of the world. And a lot of it is words like utility and it's sort of words around um, the, I, I, like related to, um, uh, you know, economic theory and utilitarianism and consequentialism. And um, I'm also quite interested to hear your take on what a rational agent would do in respect of moral reasoning, um, you know, over long trajectories. So there's there's a few things there that I'd like to understand. Yeah. So in terms of the terminology, um, it's pretty interesting. I, I guess um, the standard framework in machine learning now is to frame things, maybe not in terms of utility, they call it loss function, but it's kind of the same thing. And I think really this comes from the field of optimization, which like really got headway, you know, in the in the 20th century when we were thinking about, okay, you know, how exactly do we design economies? And like, how exactly do we like design systems to achieve some goal effectively, right? And there, I, I think it's very natural to see, oh, like, let's think consequentially about how to design these systems. Um, and maybe this is a problem, right? Because I think a lot of the risk from AI comes from having like consequential systems that pursue some goal without caring about anything else or any other side constraints. Like, okay, like maybe, like maybe these humans actually have values that are like worth preserving, right? <laughs> like, yeah. Um, what was the second thing you mentioned? Well, well, could I could I touch on that? I mean, first of all, I, I think consequentialism is is a risk for human uh, reasoning as well as um, artificial intelligence reasoning. Now, I'm I'm not going to say state that I have an opinion on this, but I know one of the criticisms of some of the um the, the long termist community is this notion. Of, I mean, certainly um. And folks like Bostrom, I think, believe um, that the universe is made of information, which leads very quickly to this simulation hypothesis, which leads very quickly to considering the utility of future simulated humans on other planets and so on. And uh, I can't remember the exact number, but I, I think he, he did some kind of calculations which led to a very, very big number, let's say times 10 to the power of 59 or something. And because that number is so much bigger than the number of humans on the planet now, it logically leads to the reasoning that we should care more about those lives than, than these lives. So, but, but anyway, and what, about the utility function as well, one of the issues I have with, let's say, reward is enough and reinforcement learning and this rationalist conception of intelligence is that the reward function would necessarily need to be so complicated. And we live in a complex system. So, you know, the problem is with any phenomenon of a macroscopic complex system, every time you create an abstraction or some kind of way of understanding that system, you exclude almost all of the truth of that system, which means any utility function would really struggle to capture the dynamics of that system. I agree. And this is why I'm quite pessimistic, actually, about alignment. I think uh, if we're building consequentialist type agents, it seems pretty hard that we're going to be able to get them not to pursue some kind of power seeking. I guess, yeah, you, you said something earlier about long-termism. Um, I guess, like, if you were to ask if I were long-termist, I'm not, like, completely sure. Like, I think I am on board with the idea that equal lives, like, that lives in the future matter equally. But I think because of uncertainty, there is maybe some implicit discount factor, um, like, with our actions, right? Um, but even, like, sort of supposing long-termism, I guess I'm not 100% a consequentialist. Um, I think, like, you know, there are norms and values and, like, rights that, like, we should probably respect. Um, I am, like, not a very good calculator of, like, you know, I, I, as you said, like, right, like, the reward function is just, like, so, so complicated. Um, I'm going to need some, like, really some heuristics to help guide me in, like, what I'm doing. Indeed, indeed. Well, um, all I want to say is I've really enjoyed this conversation. I, I, I appreciate it so much. And 
Alan, you, it's great to meet yeah. you. It's great to Thank meet you. Too. Thank you so much.